Jesus made bold claims and the people of his time were trying to figure out who he really was. His claims left them confused and sometimes angry. Through his powerful I am statements, Jesus invites us to gain a fresh perspective and a deeper understanding of who he truly is. Each statement gradually reveals the divinity and character of Jesus. As we piece them together, we see how knowing him changes everything. We know who he is because he said, I am. It is so good to have you with us today. Those of you joining us online, thank you for engaging in worship with us every week and looking into God's Word, as well as those at our Skagit campus. Glad that you're joining us today and here in the room. Thanks for being here on this day. These kind of days to me are like the teenage days of the year. Not sure if you're a kid still. I'm not sure if you're an adult yet. You know, it's 80 degrees, but the days are shorter and, and all this stuff. And we're less than a week away from September. It's just like, what is this? But we love it. It's crazy to think that next week will be September, and as we enter into September, next week is the final week in this summer series, the, shall I say, dramatic conclusion uh, to our summer series. And I know it's Labor Day weekend, but I got to tell you right up front, I am so excited about next weekend's sermon. I was sharing with our elders yesterday as we were praying. It's like, I almost want this week to be gone because I can't wait till next weekend's sermon. There's something that I've been working on for a while to end our series, and I'm super excited and to be honest, I'm a little bit nervous about it. And there's only four people on the face of, uh, actually in the, in the cosmos that are aware of this in its entirety. My wife, a friend of mine from out of state, myself, and Jesus. So I just, that, yes, that is clickbait, but that's, uh, but so you can pray for me. I am a little bit nervous, but I'm super pumped about it. That'll be next week as we finish up this series. You know, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but there's a, a song that is the most played song in the history of Christian radio. And I don't know how long the, the history of Christian radio is. Most played song, most requested, most played, and it's also one of the top selling Christian songs in all of history. And as you're thinking about what, what, what that song might be, you might come up with some thoughts. You might think Amazing Grace, that would be an, an obvious first choice for me. And for some of you who've been around for three or four or five years, you'd think Oceans, but it wasn't either of those. So it was a, a song that came out. Many of you are familiar with this song. A song that was uh, written and performed by Mercy Me called I Can Only Imagine. Most of you are very familiar with that song. And in this song, it gets to this point where trying to figure out what is my response going to be when I see Jesus? I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory. You know, what will my heart feel? You know, will I, will, will I dance before you, Jesus, or will in, in awe of you be still? Will I stand before you and on my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will, will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. And I don't know if you've ever thought about when you finally enter into that eternal rest, into the presence of God, what you're going to respond. Now, I know some of you, you've told me this. I got a whole list of questions I've got to ask. Some things I've been wondering about, things I'm concerned about, things he's going to have to answer to. Let me just tell you this. As your pastor, when you get to heaven... If you still have your whole list of questions, you are not in heaven. Because when you are in the presence of the glorified, risen Savior, Lord of the universe, where all things have been set new and made right, you will not have questions. At that point, you will just be amazed at who Jesus is, and it will all make sense at that point. So if you get to your eternity and you have questions, ooh, ooh. So anyway, John, John, who we've been looking at his gospel, because he records these I am statements of Jesus, John could write his own song, but it wouldn't be I can only imagine. His song would be, I don't have to imagine. Because on the one hand, he spent three years walking with Jesus. Jesus had called him out of the fishing industry to walk alongside with him. He had seen Jesus do incredible, mind-blowing miracles. He, he had heard him tell stories that seemed so simple and yet were so unbelievably profound. He had eaten many meals with Jesus, some of them just regular meals, but there were these other meals. Bread that was multiplied seemingly out of thin air. Fish that no one caught. Wine from a water bottle. And he had been on a boat with him, and he had walked with him, and he'd been to Jerusalem with him, he experienced the Passover with him. He had his feet washed by him. John 
was at the foot of the cross when Jesus was crucified and saw him die. John was there after the resurrection and saw him alive. But it was about 65 years later, and John's a very, very old man. He's the last of the disciples still alive. Church history would say the others have all been martyred for their faith, save Judas. He's the only one that's alive. And the emperor of Rome is a man named Domitian. And under Domitian's rule, there's a second wave of persecution towards the Christians. And because of that, John is exiled to a little island called Patmos. And one day, as John is out there, on a Sunday, as it were, he was having his own church service. He was having his quiet time. This one was different than the rest. This wasn't just like a verse of the day. This wasn't just our daily bread, Jesus speaking kind of deal. He has an experience on this Lord's day. And he hears this voice behind him. And he turns around and he sees what he says is like a son of man, like the son of man. He has spent three years with Jesus as a human, God, yes, but as a human. Now he encounters Jesus, filters off fully in his glory, in his godness. And he begins to describe this with this robe and this sash and this face, a face that is, that is like the sun in all of its brilliance. Can it, now, he had had a glimpse of this on the Mount of Transfiguration. But now he sees Jesus in all of his godness. At that point, he does not have a list of questions. He doesn't say, hey, Jesus, uh, while I got you. You remember some of the stuff Peter did? Why was he a part of us anyway? And you remember that day we wanted to wipe out that Samaritan village and you wouldn't let us? I mean, we were ready. We were going to do this. I'm still not sure about that whole thing with the Samaritans. None of that. And he doesn't have to imagine. This is how he records his response. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Conscious of what's going on, but in this paralyzed state. I can't move. I can't speak. I'm catatonic. I'm in his presence. Then he placed his right hand on me and he said, do not be afraid. While he is the glorious God of the universe, he's still that gentle shepherd. Do not be afraid. And then Jesus drops three of these ego a me, I am statements back to back to back. Now we're not studying these but these will relate to what we're going to look at today with Jesus' uh, I am statement in John. He drops these statements, and each one of them just reveals a little bit more of who he is. He says, do not be afraid. Ego and me, I am the first and the last. Notice that the F and the L are capitalized. So we're not just talking about a linear chronological order here. There's something different, and next week we'll get into that. Did I mention I'm super excited about next week? I won't talk about that anymore, but we'll come back next week. We'll get into some of that. He says, I am the first and last, second one, ego and me. I am the living one. Notice again, capital L, capital O, because we could all say, I'm the living one. You know, we've got hearts that beat. I'm a little more sensitive to those things these days. We can take breaths and we're alive. But this is capitalized, so there's something different. This isn't just I'm alive. There's a title. I am capital L living. I'm capital O one. And then he tells why. Because I was dead. And behold, and here's the third one. I am alive. And this is the key. And we'll come back to this later. Forever and ever. And, 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 just in case you're wondering... I hold the keys. I hold the keys to death in Hades, which means I own it. I'm in control of it. I've got this. Now, I love that picture, and it will relate to the, to the I am that we're going to look at today, what he says in John chapter 11. And one of the things I've loved about this I am series, and I hope you picked up on this, and you may not have. If not, uh, I'll tell you what I've been uh, attempting to do all summer long. So that in these I am statements out of John, What we see is that the I am's, they're a description of Jesus, but they're a prescription for life. They describe who he is. They show us another facet of his his being, how he operates, what he's like. But it's not just so we can have more knowledge so we can win a Bible quizzing contest about Jesus and the I am statements. It's to take those truths 
And because of that, then we can apply it to how we can live our lives in Jesus, with Jesus, as followers of Jesus, who've been renewed by Jesus, who've been transformed by his spirit. It's kind of this, if this is true about Jesus, then this is how it applies and impacts our life. If this is really who he says he is, this means this is how I can live as his follower, as his son, as his daughter. And we've been looking at these. The first week, we started with just where he said, before Abraham was, I am. He's claiming to be Yahweh, back to the Moses and Exodus kind of deal. And then we began to look at these. I'm the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. And, and then Pastor Brian uh, talked about, I am the good shepherd. Uh, Pastor Kevin Stamper talked about, I am the way, the truth, and life. And then last week, Pastor, uh, Pastor uh, Steve Osborne talked about how um, he is the true vine. And if these things are true about Jesus, then it impacts how we can live our lives. Now today we're gonna get to the final one in John, the, the Gospel of John. We, we, like I said, we'll look at another one next week. But I think this one, may be the most impactful of them all. That if this one is true, then it impacts all of life and death and eternity when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, I grew up in church, in youth groups in the 70s and the 80s, was a youth pastor in the 90s. There was a folk song written in the late 60s, early 70s. Some of you may have, it became a youth group staple. I am the resurrection and the life. Yes, yes, you have three claps. You heard it too. I was waiting for that. I was hoping. Last night, one of them was going, no, come on with it. Yeah, okay, so we sing that. We sing this song, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live a new life, will never die. And that is this hope that we have. And if that's true, that changes everything. Um, some of you are aware I had a little incident this summer and I was not allowed, still not allowed to run yet, but I wasn't allowed to drive or run for a bit. And so I was walking to church from my house, which gave me a lot of time for podcasts. And I was listening to this podcast. It was an interview with Timothy Keller, who's passed away, but it was from about a year ago and he was dying of pancreatic cancer. And he knew that unless God worked an incredible miracle, um, he was going through all the treatments, but unless God did a miracle, he was not long for this world. And in this podcast, they're asking him about that. And I don't know if you've ever listened to much of Tim Keller, but he's just so, I don't know, unemotional sometimes when he states these profound truths, just kind of in this almost throwaway statement, he says, if the resurrection actually happened, then everything's gonna be okay. Here's a man that's facing death's door. He says, you know, it's gonna be okay. And that's the hope. And that's what we want to look at today. Now, before we get there, I, I want to take us through two different scenarios. One is one that I experienced, and one is one that I heard about um, in this last few months. Here's the experience that I had. Um, some of you may be aware, my wife and I live about three and a half miles from here off of Northwest. Where our house sits, there are two cemeteries within walking distance. <laughs> Woodlawn is a half mile away and Green Acres is a third of a mile away, and we live right between them. And so often at night, we will walk, and we will walk through the cemeteries. Not kind of any kind of weird, morbid, don't think anything. It's not like that at all. However, I get free flowers from my wife all the time, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> um, okay, didn't say that one last night, because she was here. That's why. Uh, okay, um, okay, okay, come on, let's get back, get back. So we will often walk around these cemeteries just to walk around. In Green Acres, on the back side of it, is Western Washington's first natural burial ground. Everything in this burial ground is organic. It's biodegradable. It's, it's earth-friendly. And what that means is, whoever is buried back there, they are not embalmed. They're not put in caskets. They're put into a shroud and they're buried and not six feet down, three and a half feet down. I don't know this from digging. I just read this and heard about it. <laughs> three and a half feet underground. And then there's organic material, dirt and such piled up and mounded up and then wood chips put over it. And over the years, as the body decomposes and the ground settles, it just begins to kind of d descend into the ground. And so you can walk through there and you can tell how long someone's been buried by the size of the mound and how it's receding into the ground. 
And it's very, very natural. They don't water it, they don't mow it, there's no lawn, there's ferns, it's just left to just be very natural. No judgment here at all. There's no typical headstones or grave markers. There are some rocks that may be engraved, some are even on wood, but it's just real natural. So my wife and I walk through there sometimes because in these little fern areas, there's like what I call a little burial uh, cul-de-sac. Well, they just have this little area and then there's just these graves around. And again, we'll say, oh, there's a new one because it's mounded up or, you know, they've been here for a while. And, uh, and again, on some of these rocks that say who it is and when they were born and when they died, the things that are included on the inscription, some of them, it appears, not judging, it appears that they were not um, religious or faith-based, that this was a part of kind of how they just lived their life and how they wanted to end their life, okay? You kind of understand what I'm saying there? So a couple of weeks ago, Doreen and I were out there and we were walking over in one of these cul-de-sacs and there was a, a fairly new one and uh, the guy, we'll call him uh, Butch, that wasn't his real name, we'll call him Butch. So we're standing there talking. All of a sudden, a guy walks up and he said, Butch was a good guy, wasn't he? So, uh, I, you know, I don't know. I, I didn't know Butch. He said, okay. I said, well, how, how did you know Butch? He said, well, we met um, drumming together and, and at some events. And my wife, here's where drum events, she thinks band and gigs. She said, well, what was your band's name? What kind of music did you play? Where, where were you? He said, no, no, no. Drum circles, and these were his words, at, at pagan festivals and pagan events. So, okay, so now I'm kind of drawn, uh, you know, this is, it all, all the dots are connecting here. And so we were talking, and he was talking about how he was there when, when Butch uh, passed on and the drums and all that. And it was kind of like, you know, this is how he would want it to end. And I, I walked away from that thinking, that's the end of the story. It's the end of the story for this guy. It's the end of the story for Buddy here, for Butch, for... Well, just gave his name away. Man, I wasn't going to do that. I never met Buddy. Anyway, kind of the end of the story. And if that's the truth, then as the scripture says, we should just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Because that's the, that's the end of it. We live our life and there will come a day so we can do everything we can to enjoy our days, fill our days, and run from the inevitable end. But that will be the end of the story. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes this, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. That there's this grim reaper that from the moment we are born, he starts following us. And we can outrun him for a while. We can keep him at a distance. But there will come a time, no matter how long we run, no matter how fast we run, no matter what we do, that he will catch up. It is inevitable for all of us. And he will come and say, exit light, enter night, take my hand, off to never, never land end of the story. And many people live that way. And many people die that way. Let me give you another scenario. Marlene Marshke goes to our 11 o'clock service. Was raised in a strong Mennonite brethren home in Canada. God was at the center of their home and their family. Last spring, um, her father had been dealing with some, some health stuff, but last spring he began failing. And she was spending a lot of time up in Canada with him. And on April 15th, she was at his bedside. I think her brothers were there too. And it was going to be the end. And so as she was sitting there with her dad, she began to quote Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Well, as she was quoting Psalm 23, she inadvertently left out the line and thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And so her dad stopped her to make sure she got the psalm right. And said, you left out a part. And then he began to quote the psalm with her. And I picture a dad who used to take his little daughter's hand and walk and guide her through life. Is now an old man taking his daughter's, his adult daughter's hand and guiding her through these words. And they quoted these words together. 
Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That line was the last words he ever spoke. He closed his eyes. He breathed his last. And he died. And on his grave marker are inscribed these words. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Far different scenario. This isn't the end of the story. That this is a transition into the rest of the story, the real story, the true story, the better story, the eternal story. To have that. And the truth is, when Jesus comes along and says, I am the resurrection and the life, that's the hope he gives us. It's not just wishful thinking. It's not just a vain hope. It's a promise that he makes. Now, I will say this. When we talk about the resurrection, it sounds like Easter morning, you know, all these things. It is good news. But the reason it's such good news is that death is bad news. And there has to be, there must be a death in order for there to be a resurrection. And even with this good news and even with this truth and even with this hope, it does not take away the grief fully. It does not take away the sorrow. It doesn't wash over the loss. It doesn't diminish the pain. In fact, in the shortest shortest verse in the Bible, those of you who always claim this when someone asks, do you memorize scripture? John eleven thirty five. 35, it's the shortest verse in the Bible. And yet it gives us a glimpse of something so deep. And what's interesting is that this verse happened at a funeral. And the verse simply says, see, you have memorized scripture. <laughs> Jesus wept. And there have been countless commentaries and sermons on why was Jesus weeping? Because he said, it says this about him. He's weeping at the funeral after he said, I am the resurrection life. He's weeping at the funeral knowing that he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Why would he be weeping? And there's all kinds of theories on that. What if, what if the reason that it says Jesus wept is because it was never supposed to happen this way? That in God's original design and intent, there was never supposed to be death. No one was supposed to die. It was only because sin entered in and corrupted the whole thing. And when we live in this broken, fallen, cursed world, that there's death. And maybe there was this part of him that he's not weeping because Lazarus is dead. He's weeping because there is death. And what if? What if it isn't just Jesus wept? What if it's Jesus weeps? Present tense. What if he still weeps? I remember the day that this room was completely packed, standing room only, overflow for the service for Jude uh, Jude Veltkamp. What has Jesus wept on that day? I think about all the deaths this year. Ross Lindquist, who used to for years fold bulletins for us, volunteered, just a sweet man. Tracy Van Hofwagen, to pray with her just a week or two before she passed. Jerry Stevenson. Brian Funk. Dorothy Polander. Paul Rockwell. Cindy Dennison. Ron Vecved. Rick Brudwick, Rose Lukey, last spring, Jeffrey Eisenhart, and just a few months later, his cousin, Nick Eisenhart, two weeks ago today, Jerry Partlow. What if Jesus still weeps, even in the hope, because we live in a fallen broken, sinful, cursed world that was never a part of the original design. Now, it's the reality that we do live in a broken world. 
The question is, how will we face this reality? Just fill up our life and then be a fading memory of a drum circle and a receding mound in a natural burial? End of the story? Couldn't outrun the reaper that long? Or to grieve and yet know that there is hope, that it's not the end of the story, that it goes on. That's where the resurrection of Jesus Christ comes in. And there is so much, so much that we could talk about with this. Uh, N.T. Wright, who's by far the, the most, foremost New Testament scholar alive today, he wrote a book called uh, The Son of God and the Resurrection, or The Resurrection of the Son of God. 848 pages long, this tome is, just on the resurrection of Jesus. I have not read it. I don't even own it. I just want you to know that today the sermon will be shorter than 848 pages. I want us to look at one story and one line and an incredible truth. It's found, as I said, in John chapter 11, a little bit of a, kind of the setup for this. Right before this happens, Jesus and his disciples have been in Jerusalem. As is often the case, he's sparring with the religious leaders, and Jesus makes a statement that not only ticks them off, it, it's, it's almost like a, a death sentence for him. When he claims that he and the Father, Yahweh, he and the Father are one, that was blasphemy. This didn't just anger them, and it wasn't just in their heart that they had resentment towards him. It wasn't just in their mind that they wished he was dead. Scripture says they actually put, picked up stones preparing to kill him right then and there. But he escapes. I mean, it happens multiple times in the New Testament. I love that. I'd, I'd love to see how that, when they were going to throw him off the hill in Nazareth, and he just kind of slipped through the crowd. Anyway, so it's happening again. They're, they're trying to kill him, but his time has not yet come. So he takes his disciples, and they go down to the Jordan River, right where it dumps into the Dead Sea, where John the Baptist was, used to baptize people before he was beheaded. So they, they go down there, spend some time away. You know, the heat is on there in Jerusalem. They want to kill Jesus there. While they're down there by the Jordan River, word comes to him about a friend of his. See, there's this family that he's really close to, two sisters and a brother. They live in a little town called Bethany, which is about two miles away from Jerusalem, just down the Kidron Valley, up over the, the Mount of Olives. It's right there, two miles away. And it can be kind of um, surmised that whenever Jesus goes to Jerusalem, he probably stays with this family, the family of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And word comes to him that Lazarus, his friend, is sick. And Jesus stays down here. And so after a while, he decides he's going to go back to see, you know, this family in Bethany by Jerusalem. And he says to his disciples, hey, we're heading back up to Judea. And they're saying, wait, 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 what? We left there because they wanted to kill you. You think they don't want to kill you still? We're this is a death wish for sure, Jesus. Why would we go back there? John chapter 11, verse 11. After he said this, he went on to tell them, here's why. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. Now he's speaking with kind of a synonym, kind of metaphorical. Paul does this all the time with death and sleep. And he says, Lazarus has fallen asleep. I'm going to go wake him up. <laughs> to which the disciples are saying, if he's sick, let him sleep. I know you've healed a lot of people, but that's the best way to make these things happen naturally. And if he's asleep, he's got two sisters. They will wake him up. Why are we going to do this? And Jesus is talking about, yes, he's fallen asleep. He has died. And the reason that Jesus and Paul would both use these kind of, this kind of terminology with death is because they didn't see death as being the end of the story. And on this one especially, he knew that this death was temporary and reversible. But the disciples don't pick up on any of it. So I love verse 14. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Oh. So then you've got to wonder what's going through their heads. All right, so we're going back to a guy that's already dead. So he's not sleeping, he's not sick, he's dead. We're going back to an area where they want you dead. So we already got one dead man, now we're gonna have two and we're with you, so we're guilty by association. We're gonna die too probably. And one of the rare times, it's not Peter who speaks up. On this one, Thomas speaks up and Thomas would have done so much better to just keep his mouth shut. Poor Thomas. Thomas, the only time he gets quoted in the Bible, I mean, what is he known as? Yeah, that's not fair. He just had one bad day, missed church, and Jesus showed up. And anyway, so he's getting ready to make a comment. And it's like, again, you're like, oh, Thomas, this is the second time you're going to be quoted in Scripture. Do you really want this? 
Verse uh, 16, then Thomas, called Didymus, means twin, he may have had a twin brother, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> there you go, Tom, you're back in the Bible. Nice quote. You know what, I would love to say that this is a valiant statement of bravery. Like my favorite scene in Braveheart, you know, and Maximus is going into battle and he's trying to get them to not fear death. Hold the line with me. And if you find yourself riding through fields of grain, you've already died. What we do on earth echoes in eternity. Rah! And I wish that was Thomas doing that. Come on, guys, let's go. Hold the line. What we do echoes in eternity. Let's go die with him. One for all, all for one. But that kind of gallantry is not usually given to the disciples. And I guess it's more along the lines of, well, we're all going to die anyway one of these days. Might as well be today. Might as well be together. Either way, there is a truth in that statement that is so good for us. This would, this would be its own sermon. This is just a little throwaway for you. The best and only way to face life and death is with Jesus. That's the only way to face life and death. I was raised in church where we sang this old hymn, my heart is fixed on Jesus, no other hope have I. I could not live without him, and without him dare not die. So they're going back up to Jerusalem, and they get to Bethany, and Lazarus has died, and he's been in the tomb, it says, for four days. This is significant because the four-day piece. Why, you know, why would they say that? Besides, you know, this is, he, he delayed, and that comes into play later in the story. But in the, uh, the Semitic mind, there was a belief, this is not biblical, it was a belief that when someone died, that the soul would hover for about three days in the general area. But on the fourth day, when the body began to really decay, the, the soul would say, we out, and, and it would go. And at that point, it was irreversible. That was just kind of their belief. So in their minds, this is a done deal. He's been in the grave for four days. So we see this encounter with Martha. Verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Now, she's not asking him to bring Lazarus back from the, from the grave, as you'll see in a minute here. That's not even on her, on her mind. It's not even what she's kind of hinting or alluding to. But Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will. I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now again, for most Jewish people, they believed in an event that would happen at the end of history when all the dead would come back alive. Not all the Jews believed that. Pharisees believed that, Sadducees did not. That was one of the big dividing points between them. But she believed that, that there'd be this great getting up morning someday, and yes, Lazarus will rise, but we'll all rise doesn't really help right now. And then Jesus makes this statement, this ego of me, this I am statement. And this one is, the, I think, the, the biggest of all of them. Because if it's true, then it is the most profound statement for life and death and eternity that has ever been made. And if it is not true, then it is one of the cruelest things, cruelest lies that Jesus would have ever put on his followers, including us. And here's the I am statement. Verse 25. Jesus said to her, Ego a me. I am. I am the resurrection and the life. Then he begins to explain and expound on this a bit. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus doesn't say, I will usher in that resurrection someday on the end of the, of the end of the human history, or I'll, I'll bring that about. You no, know, he says, and I'm not sure that I fully understand this, but he says, I am the resurrection, but it's a double. It's an, I am the resurrection and the life. See, most of the time we pair together death and resurrection, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus says, I'm going to pair together resurrection and life. And this is, I think, really important. Because if he just said, I'm the resurrection, that's just like reanimating corpses. 
You know, in, uh, in the mid 80s, our whole family went to Israel. My brother and I were in our early 20s. We went to Bethany. We're at the historical site of, of the tomb of Lazarus. And it's this narrow stairwell that goes down into this rock hewn tomb to where you can't, all, you can't go in and out. And our bus was the only one there. And so we're going in in groups. And my dad, who was leading the group, he said, Bob and Jerry, I want you to be the last ones out of the tomb. I want to make sure all of us are on the bus before we leave. So we're down in, in, this, in this chamber down in, in the ground. And everybody's going. I said, hey, Jerry, I've got an idea. When you get out, I'll ling- linger back. And you turn around and say, Lazarus, come forth. And I'll walk out. It's like the living Bible. I mean, great idea. So everyone's going out. Jerry goes out. I, I wait back about five steps. And he, I hear him say, Lazarus, come forth. And I came out. I, I went upstairs. And I closed my eyes. And I went, Arr. And what I didn't know was while we were in there, two or three other buses of tourists had come and they're all waiting for their turn. And I come out like night of the living dead. I'm a walker, you know, and here I am, this zombie apocalypse that's happening right there. See, if Jesus just said, I'm the resurrection, he can undead them. But he says, I'm not just bringing animation back to corpses. I'm breathing life back into them. I'm the resurrection and the life. They go together. But when you read this, Then it gets a little confusing because it sounds like he's contradicting himself. It sounds like, oh wait, you're speaking out of both sides of your mouth. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Well, now wait a second. You're saying two different things. Polar opposites. Which one is it? That you believe you live after you die? Or you live and you believe and you never die? You can't have both. But I think this is why he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Because in our fallen, broken world that is cursed, our bodies will die. But there will be a resurrection. But as followers of Jesus, the life that he brings can never be killed. It will never die. I'm the resurrection for your body. I'm the life for your soul. It's not opposites. It's both and. D.L. Moody, a famous American evangelist centuries ago, he wrote these words. Someday you will read in the paper that D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I shall have gone up higher, that is all out of this old clay tenement into a house that is immortal, a body that death cannot touch, that sin cannot taint, a body fashioned like unto his glorious body. I was born of the flesh in 1837. I was born of the spirit in 1856. That which is born of the flesh may die, but that which is born of the spirit will live forever. I am the resurrection and the life. Now, Jesus could say that, But if you're going to make that kind of statement, you better be able to back it up. You better be able to prove it. And he did. Not only with what he would do with Lazarus in a few moments, but what he would do on that great resurrection morning when he conquers sin and death. We read this in 1 Corinthians 15. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried And that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And Jesus died, proven he was human. But he was raised, proven he was God. You know, I probably don't have time for this, but let me do it real quick. Can you listen fast? Okay, in Colossians 1, it says, in the supremacy of Christ, it says that he is the firstborn from amongst the dead. And I always struggle with that because he's not the first one that came back from the dead. Elijah raised a widow's son from the dead. Elisha did the same. Jesus brought back Jairus' daughter and the, the, the widow's uh, child from Nain and now Lazarus. There's at least five, maybe more, that have come back from the dead. How could he be the firstborn from among the dead? And then I realized something. All of those that were brought back from the dead eventually died again. But Jesus, firstborn from amongst the dead, is not a chronological order. It's an authority order. That what you see with Jesus, and this is what we started off with in Revelation 1.18, when he says, I am the living one, capital L, capital O. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. What that means is, 
I hold the keys. See, these other ones, they were resuscitated. They were brought back from the dead. Jesus was resurrected. He was brought through death and he conquered death. He passes through it and he is victorious over death. That is the hope that we have. These aren't just vain words. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says this, the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It was this belief, it was this understanding, it was this truth that gripped the early church so that they did not fear death. That when they would be going to be burned at the stake, they would sing hymns rejoicing in God. When they would be tortured and when their life was coming to an end, they would thank God. This is why Paul would say in Philippians 1, for me to live is Christ. To die? I mean, he doesn't have suicidal tendencies, but he says to die would be gain. And he says, that's why, that's why I'm torn with this. I mean, there's so much to be done here. But, and he says, read this for yourself in Philippians 1. He says, but for me to be with Christ would be far better. That's why he would say in Acts, I do not consider my life dear to me. And maybe church, maybe we need to get back to grasping this truth and reality because we try, and I'm, I'm not saying that we should all go out and do stupid things, but we get this idea that I don't want to die, I don't want to die, and, and, and I get that. Don't, hear me all the way out. What we don't hold on to is what it is on the other side of this death. It's not the end of this story. It's not just fading memories of drum circles and receding mounds in a, in a natural burial place. It would be like this, poor analogy, but it would be like this. If you're sitting in the parking lot of Disneyland, thinking about Disneyland and looking at a Viewmaster, some of you don't know what that is, go to a museum, looking at a Viewmaster of all these pictures of Mickey Mouse saying, this is cool, and someone says, hey, let's go into Disneyland. No, I can't leave here, this is awesome. You're missing out on Disneyland by looking at a Viewmaster. I know, bad analogy, but this is it. We get so excited about our little life here and Jesus says, yes, it's wonderful and I'm blessing you and it's great. Wait till you see what I got waiting for you. I spent six days on this one. I've been doing this one since I went back. I went to prepare a place for you. It will not disappoint. That is the hope we hold on to. In, in 1 Peter 1, oh man, I gotta stop. 1 Peter 1, 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope is rooted in the resurrection, the event and the person. And I'll say this. Grief, sorrow, loss, pain of death, it's still there. But as it says in 1 Thessalonians, we do not grieve like those who have no hope. If the resurrection happened, it's all going to be okay. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life.